Okay, uh, I'd like to welcome you, uh, welcome you very warmly to the uh, Sussex Development Lecture. Um, and the uh, speaker is David Woodward, and he's speaking on the uh, theme of between the, the wreck and the hot place. Can we reconcile poverty eradication and tackling climate change? So, uh, just a couple of notes before we start. Um, anyone who needs to leave, could they please leave? Uh, needs to leave early. That is, uh, could leave by the back doors to minimise uh, interruption. Uh, I'd also like to remind you that the lecture is being recorded uh, and it's been uh, streamed uh, live as well. So, if you are, if you don't want to be uh, seen on uh, YouTube, or whatever, um, avoid the camera. <laughs> but it's going to be recorded. Um, and also, and also, the questions are being invited from online as well. So anyone outside this room could, who's watching this could uh, uh, write, type in a question. Okay, so just to introduce David. Um, I'm very pleased uh, that David's uh, with us uh, today to give this talk. Uh, David is an independent writer and researcher on a whole range of global economic issues, uh, much broader than many academics, which makes his work so fascinating. Uh, he's the author of uh, lots of books and papers, um, including Debt Adjustment and Poverty in Developing Countries uh, from 1992, uh, The Next Crisis, Direct and Equity Investment in Developing Countries, uh, Z 2001. Um, he's worked for Foreign and Commonwealth Office, um, United Nations, World Health Organization, Save the Children. Um, he's published some really fascinating uh, material in the new for the New Economics Foundation on poverty, uh, including a brilliant piece called How Poor is Poor, uh, which I really recommend everyone to read. It's really innovative in comparison to a lot of the uh, material out there on poverty. Uh, he's also the author of, uh, or sorry, co-editor of Global Public Goods for Health, Economic and Public Health Perspectives, uh, Open University Press 2003. Uh, so David will speak for around 40 <coughs> minutes and then we'll have questions from the floor and uh, discussion. So over to you, David. Thanks very much. Hey, thanks, Ben. Okay, well, it's a, a great pleasure to be here. Um, so I'll just kick straight into the, um, the slide, which I have the um, lecture, that's helpful, uh, which I, I have titled Between the Rack and a Hot Place, which, okay, is a bit, perhaps slightly corny, Between the Rack of Poverty and a Hot Place, that is climate change. Um, just to state some starting points, uh, I think it's always quite useful to state where you're coming from, what you're your ground rules are. And basically, I've taken three starting points. First, poverty eradication is, for me, a moral imperative. And by that, I mean raising the incomes of everyone to a morally acceptable level, not just $1.25 a day, but a level that we consider to be morally acceptable for people in the 21st century to live at, and to do so within a reasonable time frame. Second, tackling climate change is a practical necessity. Um, if we don't tackle climate change, we are all in serious trouble. We've gone beyond talking about two degrees centigrade rise in temperature, although that's still notionally the objective. Uh, we now have studies talking about four degrees and even six degrees centigrade rise in global temperatures. That is a fairly unthinkable scenario. Um, and thirdly, tackling climate change is essential to poverty eradication. If we don't tackle climate change successfully, the impact will fall mostly on poor people in developing countries. And those impacts will reverse whatever progress we do make towards eradicating poverty. So that's where I'm coming from. Where are we now? Well, I would suggest, just as a rule of thumb, there is no very clearly defined poverty line. Um, I would suggest that we look at a poverty line. I generally use about $5 a day at purchasing power parity, 2005 prices. So about four times the World Bank level. Um, because it's been estimated um, by a guy called Peter Edward, uh, who estimated an ethical poverty line, um, that below that level, it starts to, um, 
poverty starts to substantially impact on life expectancy. But that's essentially a rule of thumb. Um, a majority of humanity currently lives below this level. 50% of the world population uh, lives on an income below $3.25 a day. That is about £2 a day. Now, I should say this is all at purchasing power parity. That means that it is, in principle, although there are lots of methodological issues, it is in principle equivalent to living in the UK on £2 per person per day. Um, if we look, if we take as our starting point the objective of reducing carbon emissions globally by 60%, 60 to 80%, from their 1990 level by 2050, which is what was estimated to be required to limit global warming to 2 degrees centigrade. Um, since then, global carbon emissions have gone up by more than 50%. So instead of having to reduce them by 60 to 80 percent over the course of 60 years, we now have to reduce them by something like 70 to 90 percent in about half that time. Um, if we allow for global GDP growth in the meantime, over that period, uh, the global economy might be expected to grow by a factor of about four. So if you look at it in terms of carbon emissions relative to the amount that we produce and consume, if we go on, if the global economy goes on growing at the rate it has been, at least prior to the crisis, then we are looking at a reduction of 92 to 97% in carbon emissions relative to production and consumption. So what we make today with one, dollar, uh, with one barrel of oil, we need to make with about... Uh, a fortieth of a, a barrel of oil. Um, this reduction is far beyond any realistic expectation of current or anticipated technologies. I can't see any way, realistically, this is going to happen. Um, and the longer we put off, and we are still, after 30 years, putting off doing anything effective about climate change, the longer we put it off, the longer we go on pumping more and more carbon into the atmosphere, the greater the adjustment that will be required and the less time we will have to do it. So things are not looking good. So we have, at one time, a chronic crisis of underconsumption for most of humanity. Most people in the world do not have enough income to maintain a, a minimally decent standard of living. But at the same time, we have an increasingly acute crisis of overconsumption in aggregate, that is climate change. Collectively, the world as a whole, the world population as a whole, is consuming too much, even though most of them are consuming much less than they need. You can only account for this by global inequality. So I just want to show a few numbers on the global distribution of income, thanks to the wonderful work of Branko Milanovic, who surprisingly is, um, no, actually he's not anymore, but he was for many years a World Bank economist. Um, so if we line up, my apologies that something seem, slightly strange seems to have happened to the slide. Um, if we line up the world <coughs> population from the poorest at the bottom to the richest at the top, and we look at their incomes, as a multiple of the world average. So if everyone is, has exactly the same income, if the world's income is equally distributed among everyone, you have a pattern like this, with everyone at exactly one. Of course, it doesn't look like that. So what we have is 40% of the world population with up to about a tenth of the, the global average. We then have another 20% of the world population with between one-tenth and one-quarter of the average. The next 20% has between one-quarter and three-quarters, but most of the income is up there. 
Um, by the time you get to the top 1%, we're talking about something like 13 times the global average. Now, this is a very unequal distribution. Just to give you an idea of how unequal that is, um, this is a frequency distribution of the Gini coefficient, which is a, the usually used measure of inequality in different countries. So the Gini coefficient, which goes from zero, is complete equality, to 100 is everybody, is, is one person in a country having all of the income. Um, so the Gini scores go along the bottom, um, and the number of countries um, with a Gini in that range is up the side. So we have a fairly smooth frequency distribution. Um, the highlighted columns represent the most equal and the most unequal developed countries. At the bottom, we have Denmark. At the, bot at, at the top, the, the second red column at 40, we have the United States. Just to give you an idea of the scale of inequality. So where does the world come on this graph? Well, it may or may not surprise you to know it is literally off the scale. The Gini coefficient <coughs> at, um, at power, purchasing power parity is about 70. At market exchange rates, it's about 80. Um, whereas countries, the, even the, the most famously unequal countries like Brazil, South Africa, Namibia, are around 60 to 65. So, to look at this another way, some of you may have read recently about the Palmer Index as an alternative way of, of looking at uh, inequality, which is the ratio of the total income of the top 10% of the population to the total income of the bottom 40%. Um, the richest 10% of the world population have two-thirds of the total income, 66.5%. Uh, the poorest 40% have 2.1%, that's two-fifths of the world population have about one-fiftieth of the total income. So if we calculate the Palmer Index as the ratio between the two, we get a figure of 31.7. Again, how does that compare with national, national figures? Well, the majority of countries have a ratio less than two. So the world economy as a whole has a Palmer index which is 16 times greater than most individual countries developing as well as developed. Um, to look at it a slightly different way, the top 1% of the world population, 70 million people, have about the same income, 12.9%, as the poorest, 77%. Now, some of you may have seen the recent Oxfam report, um, which shows that the wealth distribution globally is much more unequal even than this. They found that the richest 85 people in the world have total assets <coughs> greater than the poorer 50% of the world population, 3.5 billion people. Um, and it's partly that inequality in assets and in wealth that is driving the inequalities in income. Um, so if we want to talk about poverty eradication, as I say, what I mean by, by poverty eradication is raising everyone's incomes to a level that we consider morally acceptable. If we use, for illustration, a figure of about $5 a day, then that's represented by this pink line here. So we're talking about raising all of these incomes up to the threshold between the pink line and the blue. Um, and there are two ways of doing it. The first is by economic growth. Now, economic growth, in effect, means stretching the whole of this graph until the smallest column reaches that pink line. But in order to do that, 
We need to increase the incomes of the poorest 5% by a factor of 25. So if we don't change the distribution of income, we can only do that by increasing total consumption and, and production by a factor of 25. Now, firstly, at any realistic growth rate of the, of the global economy, that is going to take more than a century. Secondly, even if we could do it quicker than that, we would bump up immediately or very quickly against carbon constraints. We would have to reconcile that 25-fold increase in production and consumption with our global carbon constraints. So that doesn't look like a great option. Um, it looks less of a good option, and I should probably skip through this fairly quickly. Um, if you look at the, um, the actual trends in incomes at different income levels. This is uh, based on some figures fr from the World Bank, the World Bank's uh, PovCalNet database on poverty. And basically dividing the world up into tranches of 10% of population by income. So we have the poorest 10%, then the next 10%, and so on. Um, and this is their income, the, the change in their incomes relative to global GDP per capita between 1980 and 2010. Um, and what we see, it doesn't look too bad at the upper levels. Once you get to the bottom, it starts to look a lot less good. Um, up to 1995, you have a rising trend, but from 1995 onwards, the poorest 10% are failing to keep up with global growth. If they get less than their, their proportional share of global growth, then the global economy has to grow by a factor of more than 25 for them to reach that threshold income level. Um, so why is that? Well, a great deal of this is because of China. If you look at China, again, this is the same thing for China. Um, the Chinese population divided into tranches of 10% of population by income, and they're, in, they're showing their income rising against, quite rapidly, against global GDP. So China looks great. The rest of the world, shown by the blue lines, doesn't. Consistently, right across the poorest 60% of the world population, incomes are declining relative to global GDP. They are failing to keep up with global GDP per capita growth. Um, what's more, if you look closely at the bottom lines of each, you will see that the rate of increase in China is decelerating. The rate of reduction in the rest of the world is accelerating. So both are performing less well in the second half of the period, more recently, than they were before. And that is partly why we see this reversal in the overall trend. But what's even more worrying is the, the other reason for, the, for that, that reduction. That is, as incomes in China rise much faster than the average, so there are less and less Chinese people with rapidly rising incomes in each of these global um, tranches of population. So in 1981, the poorest 10%, 59% of people in the poorest tenth of the world's population were in China. So their rapidly rising incomes was pushing very strongly, pushing up the incomes of the average for the, the, the poorest 10%. By the time you get to 2010, that proportion is down to 11%. So the impact is much greater. So uh, the poorest 10% was dominated by rapidly growing in incomes in China, is now dominated by much more slowly growing incomes in other regions, particularly India and, sub and Sub-Saharan Africa. So, yeah, um, I, this is based on a, a paper which I, I've submitted to, but not yet published by, the um, World Economics Review of the World Economics Association, uh, which is up for open peer review if anyone would like to comment on it. Um, and basically what I did was to extrapolate these trends and say, what does this mean in terms of how long we can take to, erad we would take to eradicate poverty and how much the global economy would would need to grow. If we keep the share of the poorest 25%, or the, the growth rate 
of incomes of the poorest 10% relative to global GDP growth, constant, then how long, and we grow the global economy at 3% per year, how long does it take to eradicate poverty? Well, A, at the dollar twenty-five a day line, um, it requires GDP per capita to increase to $110,000 per person before we can <coughs> eradicate poverty at the $1.25 a day line. That is 11 times the 2010 level, and it is 3.3 times the current level in developed countries. So the whole world, on average, needs to consume 3.3 times as much as we in developed countries are consuming today in order to eradicate poverty if you just continue that trend. Um, it increases global GDP by a factor of nearly 15, and it takes over 100 years. Um, so in order to close a poverty gap, that gap between current incomes and $1.25 a day line, um, that gap is 0.6% of GDP. But um, achieving it requires us to increase GDP by a factor of 15, by 1,500%. Um, the $5 a day line, just, it just gets absurd, actually. Um, in order to eradicate poverty, you need GDP per capita of $1.35 million per person. An average income for the whole world population of $1.35 million. 135 times the 2010 level, uh, 40 times the current level in developed countries. It takes more than 200 years. Again, this really doesn't look like much of an option. The other way of approaching it is through redistribution. Conventionally, you have these two approaches, growth or redistribution. But if you look at this income gap at a $5 a day line, um, it comes to 29.5%, nearly 30% of the total income of the 25% of the world population who are above that line. But a lot of the people who are above that line are really not doing that well themselves. If you were to look at people who are relatively well off, say about the top 20-30% of the population in the UK, for example, people who are at that level of income, uh, we're talking probably about the, the richest 5% uh, of the world population, and closing that income gap would take 57.1% of their income. And you would need to do that year after year after year. Now, if anyone in this room can see that happening, taking 57.1% of the income of the richest 5% of the world population, including 20% of the UK population, every year indefinitely, well, I can't. So that doesn't look like much of an option either. Um, but it's not just about the amounts of the money, uh, just the logistics. If you're talking about income redistribution through financial transfers, the logistics are just unthinkable. Now, we're talking about reaching even at the dollar, the dollar 25 a day line. We're talking about um, reaching over a billion people. And these billion people are mostly in the most inhospitable, inaccessible, conflict-ridden areas in the world. Just to take one example, um, in November 2013, the President of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Joseph Kabila, travelled by road, for political reasons, um, he could have flown, but for political reasons he wanted to arrive by road, um, from Kis oops, Kisang Kisanganito, Kisangani, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm, I'm doing that, uh, from Kisangani to Rusuro in um, northwest DRC. Um, the distance as the crow flies is 509 kilometers, 320 miles, about the equivalent of going from Brighton to Newcastle. Just to give you an idea, the, it's shown by the red arrow. This is a map of DRC. Um, it's shown by the red arrow there. To put it into the wider context, it's shown by this little red arrow here in Africa. Um, the driving distance, though, because of limited roads, is 930 kilometers, or about 580 miles. 
the driving time for the president with a cavalcade, with his, with his motorcade, with every um, available device for getting through difficult roads. It took seven days to get there. It was an average speed of 73 kilometers or 46 miles per day. That is about from Brighton to London. Now, can you imagine in those conditions actually physically getting money to people on a regular basis, to 1.2 billion people on a regular basis? Just the logistics of income transfers really don't look terribly feasible. Um, so I would argue we need to look beyond this idea of growth and redistribution. Growth and redistribution are not sequential uh, or even separable. The assumption among economists tends to be, well, first you go for growth, and then you think separately about how you're going to distribute it. So you maximize the total amount, and then you think about a little bit of redistribution. Um, but the evolution of econo an economy um, encompasses changes in individual incomes. What you're looking at is a set of individual incomes of, say, 60 million people in the UK. And over time, those incomes change. Um, now, there are two summary measures of, those, uh, of the changes in those incomes. One is the growth rate. One is distribution. There is no reason whatsoever to think that everyone's income is going to rise up at exactly the same rate, or even that um, increases will average out at different income levels. The, the process of economic growth, the policies which underlie economic growth, affect different people in different ways, according to what they produce and what they consume. There is no reason to think that everyone is going to be equal. There's every reason to think that people will not be exactly equally affected. Um, and this applies to the global economy as, it, as much as it does to national economies. So I think I would argue we need to get away from this. And if we're, going, if we're serious about poverty eradication, we need to focus on increasing the incomes of poor people. Um, and what I've called broad sustainability, not just environmental sustainability, not just carbon emissions but doing this in a way that can be sustained, to go back to the original and literal meaning of sustainable development, so that it can be sustained financially, economically, politically, socially, and environmentally. But even if we look more broadly in terms of well-being, it makes sense to put much greater weight on lower incomes than we do on higher incomes. If you give an extra dollar to Bill Gates, he is not going to notice. If you give a dollar to a landless labourer in Mali, then it, it will make an enormous difference. It will be the difference between his family eating and not eating on a particular day. To value those two dollars the same and just lump it all together as economic growth doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I would argue we need to get away from the, the idea of trickle-down towards a concept of bubbling up. Let's focus on increasing low incomes. And if the benefits of that bubble up and rich people benefit too, that's fine as long as it's, all, it's, all, it's sustainable. Um, but let's focus on increasing the incomes at the bottom of, this, of the scale. I would argue we also need, on the climate change side, we need to move beyond just thinking about adaptation and mitigation. Adaptation and mitigation of climate change are essential. And... Prevention, as ever, is better than cure. Mitigation, if we can, the more we can mitigate climate change, the more we can reduce our carbon emissions and reduce the need for adaptation, the better. But we need both. But most of those emissions are fueled by northern consumption. Um, so sustainable development in terms of climate change is not just about low carbon development in the south. It's also about reducing carbon footprints in the north. Uh, practical, practicality, political realism, and social justice means that carbon 
um, footprint reductions need to be focused primarily in the north. The problem is that over the course of the last 30 years, we have persistently and deliberately made the process of development more and more dependent on increasing overconsumption in the north more and more by pushing export-led models of, of development. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I'll skip these. So, a binding constraint on global economic growth. If, if carbon is imposing, and I think it, it seems fairly clear that it is going to increasingly, um, if carbon constraints impose a, a binding constraint on global economic growth, then the income share of the poor and, and the share of the poor in economic growth becomes much more important. But outward-oriented development strategies rely on increasing overconsumption in the north more and more to create demand for southern exports. So we need to reduce this dependency in order to avoid increasing poverty. Um, reliance on global growth alone, as I think the figures earlier demonstrate, makes poverty eradication unthinkable. So within a century anyway, and probably well beyond that. Um, so the implications of climate change include adaptation and mitigation, but they go far beyond that. Um, I would argue that the objective of poverty eradication in the context of global carbon constraints implies a fundamentally different way, a, a fundamentally different approach to the whole way that we look at the process of economic development. So what are the, what I've called the orthodox alternatives? There's a ten, there's often when um, the, the neoliberal export-driven market-led approach is criticised, there's a tendency to assume that the alternative is either the East Asian model or going back to the model of the 1960s and 1970s of import substituting industrialization. Um, well, in many respects, both were possibly more effective than much of what we've seen in sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, the East Asian model of interventionist export-led development is very good on growth and is still being excellent on growth in China, as we've seen. Um, not bad on poverty, on the whole. Um, but that shouldn't say not poor, that should say poor on the environment. Uh, the environmental effects have been, in many countries, have been pretty serious. Um, and it is heavily carbon intensive. Uh, and above all, it's still dependent on con ever more northern overconsumption uh, to, to, um, to keep going. And to replicate it generally, um, okay, you know, when it was just uh, a handful of newly industrializing economies, it was relatively unproblematic. Once you got Thailand, Malaysia coming along, it was okay. Then China came along, and we had the Asian financial crisis, which is not entirely related, uh, not, not entirely caused by it, but it was a, a, a contributory factor. Now, if you're going to try and replicate that across the rest of the developing world, then you are getting into serious problems of scaling up. If the whole world is going to grow its exports at the whole rate, uh, at the same rate as China has over the last 30 years, who on earth do we think is going to buy them? Um, so that's not looking great in a carbon-constrained future. The other alternative, import substituting industrialization, again, was quite good on growth. If you compare the Latin American growth figures in the 1960s and 1970s with those um, since the 1980s, with the introduction of structural adjustment liberalization programs, it actually doesn't look bad. Um, but it fostered quite serious inequality, and most famously in Brazil, but also elsewhere in the region, which is only really started to be re reversed um, since about 2000. Um, and it was also, again, heavily reliant on very energy-intensive heavy industry. And again, that really doesn't look like an option, particularly across the, global, uh, across the developing world as a whole in a carbon-constrained context. So, in the time that remains to me, um, and possibly a little more, um, I'm going to set out a few basic, what I propose a few basic principles uh, for an alternative model of development. Um, 
and what I've termed working hypotheses about how development happens, how development works, um, and to try and draw out some implications from that. In terms of basic principles, let's get away from this fixation with the macroeconomy. Um, view the macroeconomy as a constraint on what we do, not as, the, uh, not as the objective. There are limits to what you can do without messing up your national economy. Um, but let's not just think exclusively in terms of how do we maximize growth and limit inflation and not have balance of payments problems. Those are incidental. The main objective should be to improve people's lives and their economic situation. And target social and environmental objectives. Target what we actually want to achieve. Um, if we can achieve poverty eradication and health for all and education for all and environmental sustainability without growth, that's great. Equally, if we can achieve them with growth, that's great too. Growth isn't the wrong answer, it's the wrong question. We should be focusing on what it is that we actually want to achieve and designing our, our policies around that. As I said, we need to move from a concept of trickling down, making the rich richer in the hope that a few crumbs will fall from the table, to a concept of bubbling up, focusing on what it is that increases incomes at the bottom of the distribution. And if the benefits trickle up to the better off, that's fine. If they don't, that's not so bad either. Um, we need to reduce the dependency of developing countries and of the development model on increasing overconsumption in the north. Um, we need, I would argue we need coordinated increases in supply and demand. I'll say a bit more about that later. Um, we need to be pragmatic. Let's not get ideological about things. Let's do what works. If markets work, let's use them. Um, if state provision works, let's use that. Let's not, impose super, uh, let's not impose an ideal model of doing everything. So just to take two examples, the spread of mobile phones in the developing world has had an enormous impact and that has been achieved by markets. Use of market mechanisms in health services has been disastrous. So it's horses for courses. If it works, if the market works, use the market. If state provision intervention works, use that. I don't care, as long as it works. Um, design policies locally for local conditions. I'm going to suggest some general outlines. All of this is critically dependent on local context. You can't generalize um, about and just have a, a, a standardized model which is going to apply everywhere. Different places are different, and you have to take those differences into account. Um, and ultimately, you have to we need to design the global system around what's needed nationally and locally. So, first set of working hypotheses. Um, the environmental impacts of the rich arise mainly from their overconsumption. The environmental impacts of the poor are mainly from pressure on them to maintain a minimal level of consumption, therefore using, using their assets unsustainably, um, uh, soil erosion or over-exploitation of local resources. Second, additional income for the poor. Uh, if, if poor households get more income, most of the things they will spend that money on are or could be produced locally using low energy technologies limiting carbon emissions. I'll say a bit more again about that in a couple of minutes. Third hypothesis, raising incomes among the poorest may well shift energy consumption um, away from high emission sources. A lot of very poor households are dependent on fuel wood, on charcoal, on dung. Particularly if you also have access to electricity, um, then their consumption tends to shift into um, cleaner energies, particularly into electricity, um, and hopefully renewable, uh, renewable energy. So if we concentrate income gains among the poor, then we can limit the growth of carbon emissions. Just to, to visualize that, the hypothesis is, and I, I should say, this is hypothetical. Um, the next stage is to find evidence to assess the extent to which the 
uh, evident, the, the hypotheses are justified. Um, so the hypothesis is that at least over very low incomes, you have relatively low um, carbon content per additional dollar of spending, which rises as income increases. Um, that is likely to peak at some point, as, as yet unspecified. Um, probably a fairly high point. But um, it seems to me likely that uh, if you concentrate incomes, income growth at the lowest levels, then the environmental impact will be more limited than if they are at higher levels in the distribution. A related hypothesis, again, if you, sp if you provide additional income to poor households, it's spent largely on basic goods and services. Um, they will diversify their diets, they will eat more fish, more meat, more protein, um, more vegetable oils, more uh, fruit, vegetables, rather than just uh, a diet which is overwhelmingly dominated by staples. Um, they may well buy basic household items, they may well improve their houses, um, they're likely to buy uh, agricultural or artisanal tools. Uh, they may buy clothing. Most or all of these things are or could be produced locally by poor households themselves and using labor-intensive technologies. Um, so if that hypothesis is correct, then you have the potential, by increasing the incomes of the poor, to generate additional demand for the things that they use to generate income. So, again, just to visualize, probably fairly self-explanatory, poverty impact higher at, at lower incomes than at higher incomes. So what does this mean? Well, first, we need to focus not just on the macroeconomy, but also at the community level, at the local economy level. Also, we need not only demand management or supply-side economics. We went from this period um, up to the 1970s when there was a very strong focus on demand management, Keynesian demand management. Um, then along came Mrs. Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, and we forgot all that and said, it's all about the supply side. It's all about supply-side economics. Um, well, that's really worked, hasn't it? Um, so... It's not just about demand, it's not just about supply. You need to focus on both um, and to increase both at the same time in parallel. Um, as I said, we need to focus on increasing the incomes of poor households through income generation, microfinance, labor-intensive public work, local procurement, and so on. Uh, but at, at the same time, we need to relieve the constraints on production by poor households. So, on the one hand, you're creating the demand for these goods, but you're also increasing the capacity of households to, to produce the goods whose demand are being increased as you reduce poverty. Uh, and that means targeted infrastructure improvement, uh, investment in health, education, access to financial services, and so on. Um, and focusing on the, on the production of those goods whose demand is increased by the poor having more purchasing power. So you target your income generation programs, um, your microfinance, agricultural extension, towards the goods whose production is going to be increased, uh, whose demand is going to be increased by the additional demand as poverty is reduced. Uh, you may also need to introduce selective trade restrictions where necessary. Um, this probably isn't going to work if you then get flooded with mass-produced Chinese imports. So you may also need um, selective trade restrictions uh, to, to, to back this up. Second set of working hypotheses. Um, rural development has a high impact on poverty. Most, the majority of poor households are in rural areas. Um, and it also has the potential, if you increase incomes in rural areas, then you are likely to slow down the rate of urbanization, which will relieve a lot of problems in, in the urban areas too. Second hypothesis, um, energy access is a key constraint on rural development and the diversification of rural economies. Lack of access to, to electricity limits uh, what, you can, what you can produce, how effectively, efficiently you can produce it. But among the major constraints 
to having energy in many rural areas in developing countries is remoteness and population sparsity. Um, because fossil fuel systems are generally based on a centralized model. So you have an electricity generator which needs quite a substantial scale to be economic. And then the electricity is transmitted out from that generator to enough households to meet the demand to keep it, to make the, the, the scale viable. But if you're in a very sparse, sparsely inhabited area, um, then A, the investment cost for all that transmission is very considerable. B, you're probably not going to reach enough people anyway to have a viable scale. Um, and C, you will have a lot of energy losses through the transmission system, which you do on a fairly substantial scale even in the north. If you can imagine doing this in, uh, again in rural Mali or somewhere, then you're going to ha have a lot, much greater losses. Um, fourth, many rural areas have substantial, not necessarily all, but many have substantial potential for micro-renewable technologies. Renewables have the advantage of being viable at a much smaller scale than, um, than centralised fossil fuel systems. And it seems to me, um, and I've, I've done a certain amount of back of the envelope number crunching on this, you know, there is a very substantial potential to reduce the cost of micro-renewables globally through economies of scale and learning effects. If you think of any new piece of technology, um, if you think of mobile phones, for example, and when mobile phones first came in, they were car phones, they were a luxury. Only, only a handful of people had them. They were a real status thing. Um, and the, the, but the, as the time goes on, products move from being um, a, a niche market, a niche luxury, prestigious market for a very small number of people at very high prices. And over time, they get smaller and cheaper and more effective and so on. Uh, just as an example, my, my first laptop, um, which I bought 20 years ago, um, had a total memory of 40 megabytes. It was about that thick, weighed a ton, um, and this, was, this wasn't even the first generation of them. Um, 40 megabytes, and it cost then 1,200 pounds in 1982. Um, now, you would get a vastly better, faster, bigger, well, not bigger, physically smaller, but greater capacity uh, laptop for a fraction of that price. So that, uh, we can accelerate that product cycle. If we can accelerate that product cycle, then we can reduce the cost of renewable technologies um, and make them much more viable um, in, in uh, rural areas. Yeah, and if you can uh, create, if you can turn the enormous notional demand for renewable energy in rural areas across the developing world into effective demand. Demand only starts to impact on the market when there's money backing it up. And by definition, there isn't money backing it up. If you can turn that notional demand into effective demand, then you can accelerate that process, that, that product cycle, and lower costs. So I've just spotted the time, and I need to accelerate, rather. Um, Okay, so the implications, I would propose establishing a major global aid fund to finance investment in micro-renewable energy technologies for rural areas in developing countries, so as to accelerate the, the product cycle. Um, also promoting, finance, um, promoting and financing research and development to develop capacity for local production, maintenance and long-term technological development. Um, and in all of this, we need to emphasize reliability, low-tech rather than high-tech, for example, solar thermal energy rather than necessarily just thinking about solar panels, uh, low maintenance and adaptation to local conditions. Third set of working hypotheses. The current economic model depends very heavily on foreign investment. Um, if we are looking towards lowering overconsumption in the north um, and potentially slowing um, economic growth rates in the north, then we're likely to see a growth in, in, uh, in a decline in the growth, or, sorry, a reduction, in fact, in, in foreign investment, in funds available for foreign investment, as demand for its products falls. Um, 
um, is typically less labor intensive than local investment and has more limited links with the local economy. When a foreign investor comes in, then they tend to import relatively, labor, relatively capital intensive technologies with them um, and to import much more of their inputs rather than acquiring them from the local economy. Um, it has potential adverse effects on the macro economy in the long term, particularly through the balance of payments, except in particular circumstances. Um, it's beneficial only in certain circumstances, and the whole process of comp competing for um, FDI further reduces the potential benefits. As countries are bidding away the potential development, developmental benefits, for example, through tax holidays, um, in order to attract a greater flow in. And that's a completely destructive process. Um, the, market, the other benefits attributed to um, foreign direct investment is market access. If we're looking towards a, a less outward-oriented model of development, then that's probably less beneficial anyway. Um, and the poverty reduction effects of investment, again, this is a hypothesis, are, uh, I would su suggest, likely to be inversely proportional to the scale and the proximity of investor. The smaller and more local an investor is, the more they are likely to use local inputs, the more labour intensive their technologies are likely to be, and therefore the greater impact they will have on poverty. So implications, well, let's focus on retaining capital in the country for investment rather than attracting foreign investment. At the moment, there are enormous capital flows of various forms going out of developing countries um, in the form of, of, of capital flight, um, while countries are desperately trying to to, to bid away all the development benefits to attract foreign capital in. Well, that isn't making a great deal of sense. Let's focus on retaining the capital that is there um, and using it effectively rather than trying to compete to attract more foreign investment in. Um, focus on stimulating small-scale domestic investment rather than competing for large-scale foreign, foreign investment. Um, encourage and facilitate investment by the diaspora. The di diaspora, again, this is a hypothesis. The diaspora may be a way of combining the best of both worlds from um, of foreign investment and of local investment. You have some degree of access to technologies which are not necessarily available in country. You have some degree of access to markets which are not necessarily available to local investors. Um, but you're more likely to be using more labor intensive technologies. You're more likely to be using more uh, local inputs. Um, Catalyze uh, investment of, in production of goods whose demand will be increased, again, um, by, by all producers through, for example, uh, providing market information, targeted credit, financial incentives. Uh, this is the last set of working hypotheses you'll be pleased to hear given the time. Um, a well-resourced, effective and active state has played a central role, I would suggest, in every case of successful development, even if you look at the most free market success stories like Hong Kong and Singapore, there was still a very strong and very active state there. Uh, but most low-income countries and least developed countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, the state is seriously under-resourced, both financially and in terms of human resources, and this is a major constraint on successful development. So successful development requires increasing public revenues and increasing human resources available to, to the state and in each of the private sector. So the implications where well, we need to increase public revenues. Um, and a key factor here is the international system. International coordination and regulation to tackle what have been called the fiscal termites of tax competition, um, including transfer price manipulation by, uh, by um, transnational companies. And we need to focus on strengthening administrative capacity, not least the, um, the capacity to collect taxes. I would suggest, uh, perhaps somewhat provocatively, um, that we should start considering restitution for moral debt, not least uh, over for climate change. The climate, the climate crisis is entirely the result, historically, of northern emissions. Um, if, the, if the north had consumed and emitted carbon, at the rate of the rest of the world, there would be no climate crisis. We wouldn't be talking about climate at all. Um, and there's quite good data to support that. 
So why are we not, you know, why are we now arguing about burden sharing between North and South? This is our problem which we created. Um, yes, we need aid. We need more and we need better aid. But we need it as a stopgap. This is not a solution. Aid is not a solution. Aid is a temporary necessity because everything else is so messed up. Um, and one of the priorities for aid is increasing administrative and tax capacity, to increase countries' capacity to raise revenues locally so that aid doesn't create dependency but helps to reduce financial dependency. Um, second, we need to increase human resources, which means strengthening education, including adult education, um, fostering regional cooperation in advanced education, um, tackling the brain drain by improving salaries, working conditions, uh, reducing northern con recruitment, um, establishing compensation mechanisms for brain drain from um, human resource scarce countries, um, and tackling the demand for human capital as well as the supply side. Uh, there's a tendency to think, yes, there's a, there's a human capital shortage, we must educate more people. But if people cannot actually get jobs when they get the education, then you're probably not going to be doing a lot of good. Uh, migration, I, I think the brain drain is becoming a greater issue than, than under provision overall. Though access to provision, of course, is entirely another question. Um, global dimension, very briefly. Uh, some of this could be done nationally, but to be really effective and certainly to happen on a global scale, we need a facilitating global economy. We need to start with what's needed at the local and national level and build our global system around that, rather than the current top-down system in which basically we decide what rules we want at the global system, uh, at the global level, and then whatever falls out from that, well, that must have been what we wanted. Like, uh, you know, uh, uh, free financial markets, trade liberalisation. You, you start, again, you start with the ideology. You say, well, what is needed is free markets in finance and trade, not, of course, in unskilled labour. Um, and whatever falls out of that must be what we wanted, because markets are efficient. Um, get away from that, from, se from setting the rules at the top and seeing what happens, to designing the rules around what is needed at the, the national level. So, a quick checklist and quick and rather limited checklist of global requirements. Effective and enforceable global action to ensure contraction and convergence of carbon emissions is an absolute necessity. Uh, the global Renewable Energy Fund, I've, I've talked about a bit. Coordinated action to tackle uh, tax competition, transfer price manipulation and so on. Um, coordinated action to tackle the brain drain, including compensation mechanisms. Um, Sufficient flexibility where appropriate for temporary and targeted trade protection in support of a viable development strategy. Um, avoiding trade agreements which preclude all of these things. This is going to be a major constraint. The growing web of bilateral and regional trade arrangements um, which impose quite serious restrictions um, on what governments will be able to do in terms of, um, uh, in terms of well, anything really. Um, increased aid, including for micro-renewables and not least for tax systems. Restitution of moral debt, including for climate, additional to aid. Um, we could think about enforceable global commodity agreements, uh, but given the time I won't develop that idea. And collective bargaining on mineral rights, um, so that um, countries can basically get a better deal on, on mineral deals which is starting to happen a bit with China coming in. There's a bit more competition um, for, for mineral resources than there was, but there's still a long way to go. But none of this is going to happen without a real democratisation of global governance. As long as we have a system of global economic governance with, which is effectively run by and for the rich people, the rich and the corporate and financial sectors in the rich world, none of this is going to happen. And I shall stop there. Thanks very much. Oh, yes. Thanks, thanks very much, David. That was uh, a brilliant talk. A uh, huge amount of data and ideas to uh, grapple with. And, uh, I should have the contribution.
democratization of global governance. When you talk about democratization of global governance, you intend a um, sort of global government elected by citizens, one vote, one head. And if so, do you think that those famous billion and more Chinese who are getting best by the actual growth will vote for applying this kind of program? Thank you. I'm just curious, with, with these global requirements, if you can talk about any mechanisms for compliance at all with, with any of these ideas. And I mean, from a moral standpoint, I don't think many people would disagree with them, but. Um. Hi. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk, uh, lovely talk. I have, I think, two questions. Uh, at the start of your presentation, you began that your approach is um, a moral economy. And I was just wondering how does that fit within the institutions that you've been worked for or within the institutions which are admin administrating um, agendas for po poverty. Uh, the second question is about the ethical poverty line that you talked about um, and to, fr what I got from your from your presentation is that it is a global line rather than just the below the minimum um, so in a sense it doesn't only address the developing countries but to me it seems that it has implications for developed states as well um, and I mean, if so, that, that's amazing, but how do you see that happening? I mean, including the developed states, restructuring the developed states uh, in order to tackle uh, poverty agendas. Because usually when you read or when you hear about poverty, it's surprisingly just the particular states that are in that. And my final uh, question, um, you suggest about a financial financial structure in place to support renewable alternatives at the local level. Do you have something in mind? Um, because I do have some sort of very vague understanding of a system that's going on and it's not really working. Uh, for example, we, we've, we had ethanol as an alternative um, as a renewable, renewable source of energy um, and around that because it is part of production of, of, of oil so if, if it's added to energy uh, sources it, it means that we need actually in fact less uh, um, um, in, or something along those lines and there was actually a financial market created for that uh, with a monetary system within it and with investors which create, which in actually create, did create demand, uh, which is something that you kind of discussed about. Yet, the, and, and this demand is regulated by, if, for example, if, if we know that there is um, more an, an initiative for poverty or for climate change uh, initiatives, then the demand goes up. But because of that, it's actually very flexible towards the global governance and towards the uh, people at the top who decide whether, okay, maybe we can sa sanction the U.S. at their ethanol production at this stage. So it does. I, I'm not completely sure how such a thing can work. That, that, that. Thanks very much. Um, we've got to until about we've got about well, 20 or so minutes. So perhaps you could answer yeah. in, in reasonable uh, time to allow more questions uh, from the floor. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I mean, the first two questions are, are somewhat linked <coughs> on the, the issue of governance. Um, what do I mean by global governance? Do I mean uh, a national, uh, a, a global government on the same basis as, um, uh, sorry, a global government on the same basis as a national government? Um, not really. Um, I'm not sure that is a viable option within the, the foreseeable future. 
Um, I think what I'm talking about is a democratization of global institutions. Um, if you look at the IMF and the World Bank in particular, uh, their whole decision-making structure is based on an economically weighted voting system, which gives the developed countries, who are about 15% of the world population, about 60% of the votes in the IMF, a majority of the votes. Uh, it gives the United States, who are about 4% of the world population, about 17% of the votes, no, 16 now, um, which is enough to block, uh, is a blocking minority on any major policy decision. Um, now, we wouldn't think about a voting system like that at the national level. Can you imagine in the UK if we had a voting system which gave rich people more votes than poor people? It doesn't, that's not democracy. So why on earth do we still have that system at, in international organisations? Um, why is our government and our other supposedly democratic governments continuing to defend that system? Yes, in the IMF there has been a certain amount of movement um, towards reforming that system. But that reform has primarily taken the form of giving more votes to the emerging market economies, the successful, richer developing countries, to reflect their greater economic weights. So the, the argument has been based on, not on this is undemocratic, but okay, the economic, weighting voting, the economic weighted voting principle is fine, but the economic weights are a bit wrong. So we'll give the, um, the middle income countries, the Chinas, the, um, the, the Indias, the Brazils, some more votes. Well, no. I mean, the main point is that the, the, it's the poorest countries that are most underrepresented. And there was an element of correction, but essentially, by, by increasing, there's, just, there's uh, what's called a basic vote, which is <clears throat> equal among countries. Um, and the proportion of basic votes was increased a bit. But that was essentially to make sure that the poorest countries didn't actually lose votes, which they would otherwise have done. In fact, they would have lost quite a lot of votes. Um, so we've got a long way to go there. Uh, there are lots of other issues to raise in terms of the, the dynamics of decision-making processes, for example, in the WTO, the way the decision-making processes ha happen. Um, financial dependency, particularly in United Nations um, agencies, um, whereby uh, United Nations agencies, uh, for example, the, the, the WHO, um, less than a third of its funding comes from regular contributions from its members, which is envisaged as its main source of funding. Um, it depends for two-thirds of its income on voluntary contributions from individual governments and from corporations. Now that inevitably skews its agenda. Um, it's difficult to see how that could not be the case. Um, so the money goes into those areas where countries uh, with substantial resources are willing to provide the funding and for as long as they're willing to do it. Um, so it's inevitable that that will skew the agenda. Um, similarly, the allocation of, um, of responsibilities between agencies, where they're dependent on additional funding, primarily from developed country governments, the developed country governments can decide which institution they are going to provide the money for to work on a particular issue. So if you look again in the field of health, a lot of things that you would think might be done by WHO, for example work on health systems, is primarily being done in the World Bank. Why? Because that is where the developed countries have a greater say over what goes on. And I think health health systems work would look quite different. There is some health systems work in, in, uh, in, in WHO, but, um, but I think health systems in developing countries would look very different if that role had been played by WHO rather than the World Bank. Um, yes, would, would people in China vote for this? Oh, is the one thing I'd say on, in terms of... Um, uh, sorry? Yes, yeah, so, so shifting votes, but also increasing accountability 
um, to populations rather than to governments. I think the fact that in international institutions, governments are always the intermediary. So the representatives to an international organization are appointed to and at, at best accountable to government. Sometimes, again, in the case of the IMF, there's quite, the accountability mechanisms are actually very weak, except for the major developed countries. Um, but I think if we can make the rep representatives in international organizations more accountable to populations and not exclusively to governments, for example, by increasing accountability to parliaments and increasing the role of parliaments in accountability processes, I think that could be quite a significant step forward as well. Um, would people in China vote for anything like this? I, I, I really don't know. Um, I think, you know, sorry? Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, I, I think, yes, I think, um, personally, I would quite like to see, um, I, I think that a case can be made for, let's put it that way, um, a global parliament, not for a global govern, government, but I think if you could have a global parliament, uh, which is elected on, uh, you know, with, with a s allocation of seats according to um, democratic principles, um, I think that could have you know, that could have some influence in terms of providing legitimacy and providing greater uh, accountability. Um, not least as a way of making sure the system is not exclusively um, dependent on governments. If you can broaden that accountability at the international level. And I think if you could start doing that at the international level, hopefully you might see some benefits in terms of democratization at the country level. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree, you're not going to have a perfect system but I think there are ways in which the present system could be improved quite a lot. Um, and that, I think, is, is linked to this, this question of compliance. One of the most fundamental problems, one of the reasons we can't have a global government, government is the government ultimately depends on having um, a monopoly of force. Ultimately, the reason why our government works is because they control the army. Um, being being quite cynical, okay, we've forgotten about it because you know, we haven't had a civil war for centuries now. Um, but ultimately, that's it. You know, the reason why you don't break the law is because a policeman's going to come and bang on your door. Um, the reason why you don't shoot the policeman when he comes and bangs on the door is because somebody's going to come along with a lot more guns than you've got if, they, if you do. It's ultimately down to uh, a monopoly of power. Now, at the global level, you don't have that. The monopoly of power is with national governments. We don't have a global army which is going to come round and uh, sort out any national army of any country which disobeys. And we probably don't want one, frankly. I think the, the idea of a, a global army is not a terribly, not one I would greet with great enthusiasm. So I'm not sure that that national model of monopoly of force is one which is, is viable or desirable at the global level. Um, so we need to look at what can substitute for that. Because if you go back a hundred years, national governments made pretty good sense because the economies, societies worked at the national level. And increasingly that's not the case. The financial system is way beyond na the nation state. Most of the business sector is dominated by transnational companies which don't operate within a national state. They operate across national states. Um, you know, increasingly, in a globalized world, the economy, economic activity, social activity, with the internet, communications, no longer operate within societies. Now, if you look at the process of industrialization um, in developed countries, the Industrial Revolution, what you saw then was a parallel emergence of national economies as local economies became more and more integrated. And in parallel or slightly behind those grew up national institutions, um, national government, uh, parliaments, uh, ministries, central banks, 
you know, financial markets, the, they grew up in parallel with, with that process. Now, at the moment, we have a mismatch. We have an increasingly globalized world, um, but the same institutions, pretty much, that we had 70 years ago. Um, okay, we've developed more institutions, probably too many more institutions, but in a completely piecemeal fashion. Um, you know, again, because it has suited or not suited the interests of individual influential governments to, for example, to create a new UN AIDS rather than putting it into an existing World Health Organization. Um, to create a global fund for AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria, whilst keeping UN AIDS separate from it and keeping it separate from WHO. Um, so we've developed this patchwork of international institutions which don't really cohere very well uh, with lots of conflicts. I mean, they fundraise from each other. I mean, how much sense does that make? Um, you know, you have one international organization asking another international organization to fund its work on something that they're both working on. Um, there, is so, there, is, there seems to me to be too much duplication, a lot of structures which don't, just don't really make sense. Um, and I think we're long overdue for a consolidation that to have a, a new Bretton Woods conference or something like, well, preferably not quite like Bretton Woods conference, but this time with everybody there with a certain amount of democratic process, um, but something like that sort of process to think, well, what is the institutional framework that we need for the 21st century? Um, to deal with the problems that we have now, with the values that we have now. Bretton Woods happened in the colonial era, and it shows. Um, the, uh, the mandates of institutions have changed without their basic governance structures changing. If you look at what the IMF is doing now, or the World Bank, compared with what they did when they were founded, what they were founded to do, what they were designed to do, there's a big mismatch there. Um, things have changed, institutional structures haven't changed with them. You know, there's a need to think about what is the institutional structure that would actually make sense for the 21st century, for the new challenges like climate change, which weren't even thought of. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Um, yeah. The moral agenda and institutions. Um, it's quite a tricky, a tricky question. Um, I think most people working in most institutions would see themselves as following some degree of moral agenda. Um, even, uh, I think one thing which I think you tactfully didn't mention was my working in the Executive Director's Office in the IMF and World Bank. Um, even in the IMF, most of the people, I think, um, think they're doing the right thing because they actually believe in, they believe that the IMF model provides, if not all the answers, at least enough of the answers. Um, and I had some quite interesting conversations with people on this, because I didn't entirely take this perspective. Um, so yes, I think most people do, do believe in that they have some, some degree of moral purpose, um, what that moral purpose is. I think there, there are issues around priorities and um, how far you take things. I mean, in the case of the, the poverty line, um, I was actually just saying to, to Ben earlier, um, essentially, it's essentially arbitrary. The $1.25 a day line, um, and this is part of my problem with it, uh, basically what they did when they first established the $1 a day line was to take, to look at um, national poverty lines decided by each individual country, um, and then they took the low income countries only, and then they took the 10 lowest poverty lines in those low-income countries, and then they took the midpoint of those 10 lines. Now, that's a completely arbitrary process. It happened to come out at about a dollar a day, which was a nice round number. It happened to come out at about, at that time, 30% of the, um, of the uh, population of developing countries, which was a reasonable sort of pro proportion to talk about targeting. Um, so, and then it's still there. And when they've updated it, uh, they haven't updated it in line with inflation. 
they've repeated this process because they, every now and then so this was based on 1985 prices this was no it wasn't even that actually it was 1980 anyone i can't remember i think it was i might be 1981 83 anyway um but they've updated it every now and then they reweight it um they reweight the price indices that they use um and when they do that rather than just adjusting it in line with inflation they then go through the process again and re-estimate it another poverty line. So it actually hasn't, if you just look at, compare it with the, the rate of price increases, um, it doesn't actually reflect that, that increase. So this is all quite an arbitrary process. It's not actually based on any consideration, except to the extent it was, it was included in some of those national poverty lines. But even then, those were only in low-income countries. They were only the lowest poverty lines in low-income countries. And then we're applying it globally. We're applying it to Thailand and China. Um, well, I'm not sure, you know, it, it's, it's, quite an arbitrary, it's quite an arbitrary process. Um, now, yes, the, you asked about the ethical poverty line. Um, now, the ethical poverty line was developed by somebody called Peter Edward. Now, he looked at the um, relationship at the national level between income and life expectancy. And you see a curve. It's sort of like a log curve. Um, but he observed what appeared to be a kink in it. So he hypothesized that you had a similar sort of relationship within countries. And then he um, adjusted national data for income distribution on that assumption. And from that, he estimated where that kink might arise in the national data. So again, it's quite arbitrary. And I personally, I think there are some issues with the methodology. Um, which are actually discussed in a paper uh, on the, the Nef New Economics Foundation website. Um, but that's, that's basically the, the process. Yes, it was a in principle a global line. Um, whether he, I can't remember whether he included developed country data in it, but it probably wouldn't make, I think he did actually, it probably wouldn't make a, a great deal of difference. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's a global line. Um, the, the paper which Ben suggested was a sort of alter, a national level alternative to that, uh, which I did for the New Economics Foundation, which I called a rights-based poverty line. Um, and basically the idea is, and it's, it's largely about making moral judgments explicit. Um, so basically the idea was that you map the, I, I, I did it for the um, infant mortality rate, and you map that against income. Um, and what you see is infant mortality rate declines at, uh, when the date is good, um, at uh, declines against as income rises. And then you can say, well, this is the poverty line, uh, this is the level of child mortality or infant mortality that we consider reflects the right to child survival. So you do tie it in directly to rights. Um, and then you can say, well, if we believe that the right to child survival is only met with an infant mortality rate no greater than 30 per thousand, for example, which is about five times what it is here, um, then you can estimate in a particular country what is the income level at which that is on average achieved. Uh, so that's a, a more sort of country-specific country um, approach. To it. And you could do that with, with, with alternative indicators. Um, the other question you raised was on, on ethanol. I think ethanol is quite problematic. I mean, when I'm talking about renewable energy, um, I'm, I'm leaving out the ethanol <laughs> stuff because I think there are a lot of environmental problems. There's a lot of question as to whether it actually even reduces carbon emissions. Um, a lot of questions about the water usage, all the rest of it, the impact on food markets. Um, I mean, they're probably the, I mean, the food price crisis probably wasn't actually caused by that, but it, was cert it certainly contributed. I mean, uh, speculative behavior, change in the financial markets probably had a greater effect as, as a cause. Um, but the perception of that increase in demand from, from ethanol, I think, was, was a, a, a contributing factor. Yeah. Thanks very much, David. We've got uh, about two minutes left, so that will be a very quick question and a very quick answer. So, the lady there, please. Um, I enormously enjoyed your presentation. 
But I was just concerned about the increased aid as a global um, solution. Because as you know, aid is tied heavily anyway already. And um, how would increased aid help in ta collecting taxes? And the other point you suggested was um, collecting taxes and renewable, renewable energies. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Um, yes, I don't, I don't think increasing aid is, is a solution. Um, I think it's probably, uh, you know, that we're looking at quite substantial resource needs in the short term um, for infrastructure improvement reorientation. If we shift the development model towards a less export focused model, um, in a lot of countries that's going to require quite a big Re reorientation of the transport system, plus um, adaptation and, uh, and so on to climate change, um, switching over energy systems. You know, there are a lot of upfront costs here. Um, the question is, where is the money going to come from? Um, and I think aid is, in the short term, is probably where that is, is going to need to come from. Um, yes, I would like to see reparations for climate change. I think the entire bill should be footed off the aid budget f by, uh, by the developed countries. Um, but I think you know, we need that, we, we're probably going to need that in, in the short term. Um, but we need to make sure it doesn't increase financial dependency. Um, so yes, you know, let's put it into, as I say, a global, a global energy fund for renewable technologies. Now that is not actually going to um, impact you're not talking about hopefully conditionalities on that I mean I did say uh, the other thing is you know I, I did say more and better aid and the better is about conditionalities it's about tying it's about everything that's in the uh, the Paris agenda and much else besides you know it's about making sure that countries that aid actually goes to countries uh, to meet their priorities based on their agendas um, and to shift away from a top-down model which is based on promoting commercial interests, financial interests. Let's make aid, aid is supposed to be overseas development assistance. Let's make it about development. Um, now, clearly there is a tension between that and the political case for aid, which tends to rest on, in practice, on commercial interests. Yes, we have um, make poverty history, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes down to it, um, probably a, a significant part of the reason why we, we still have any aid at all um, is that it helps to promote financial interest. So there is, there is a tension there. But we need to push that aid quality agenda um, and say, look, this is, this is supposed to be about development. No, let's make it about development. Let's not use aid as, um, as a lever to push countries into trade agreements which are going to damage their long-term interests. Um, let's not use it to promote our financial and commercial interests at their expense. You know, let's use it in accordance with local priorities um, and use it constructively towards sustainable development. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, David. I'd like to uh, thank you and uh, invite the audience to thank you as well. Thank you very much.